Hello, I'm Pastor Horace Dowdy in Lexington, Virginia, and each Sunday I bring you a biblical meditation, and today I'm going to talk about a, a passage from James uh, in the New Testament, and the title of the lesson is, Your Religion Should Be Helpful. Now, if you enjoy these meditations, then I encourage you to go to Horace Dowdy YouTube Click on like, click on subscribe, and then click on the bell icon so that you'll be notified. And share these meditations with your family and your friends and your neighbors. I appreciate that. Your religion should be helpful. Most human beings are religious. They develop some sense of a higher power out there. How should they respond to this? And in answer to that question, a thousand religions have emerged. Christianity is one of them. You would think that after narrowing down the field to one choice, the details would be clear and simple, but that's not the way it is. Within the Christian religion alone, hundreds and thousands of conflicting interpretations remain. Earnest people eventually work out a system of religion which they can accept. Yet in every house of prayer, a vision of God is different with every body, every single person, and what each person expects and requires is not the same as you, for example. Don't worry, Almighty God obviously makes room for conflicting opinions. He probably expects you to do the same. All over the world, Convents and monasteries are filled with people doing what they believe that God requires. Total attentiveness, commitment, every hour, every day, suppressing all the instincts of nature. That God is our God, your God. In primitive communities, some Christians are handling rattlesnakes this Sunday morning as part of their ritual. Their God is your God. I have devout friends who feel deprived at church. If they are not dangled dangerously over the pit of hell, their God is my God. Years ago, one of my church members said as I prepared to enter the pulpit, Preacher, give them hell. Later, after I thought about it, I told him gently, Bill, I'm not here to give them hell. They have enough of that already. My purpose is to give them heaven. Hundreds of years ago, a Jewish preacher named Jeremiah had heard enough about the demands of Almighty God, how righteous people must bring costly sacrifices to the altar and pay their religious dues. The heavier the demand, the better your prospect when you deliver. And Jeremiah said, Speak no more of the burden of the Lord. Those Jews had taken a religion meant to be uplifting and turned it into an irksome obligation of duties and rules. And the fiery prophet declared with authority, you who make those rules, you are a burden to the Lord. Jesus Christ, another Jewish preacher, picked up Jeremiah's theme and from the teachings of Jesus, our Christian religion emerged and spread over most, most of planet Earth. You and I are fortunate. Jesus cleared the air. He spoke simply about how God would have us respond. He added action to his words. He lived an actual demonstration. If religion is a chore and a burden, let me help you with a few plain facts. Jesus, the founder of our religion, laid out some basic principles which are positive and comforting. First and foremost, Jesus insisted that God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, is your Father. God loves you as much as any earthly parent and more. You are to honor your heavenly Father, but never fear him. God wants you to be happy, just as you wish your children to enjoy life. 
And every commandment has a single goal to guide you toward happy, fruitful living in this world. What are the burdens about, about that? If you envision God as a stern, demanding divinity, stop, because you're wrong. Your Heavenly Father is far more eager to give than to receive. His laws become your songs. Those laws lift you with wings as eagles. They do not repress your fun. Sadly, millions of good people think they must placate God or he will send them to hell. Somehow, they have misunderstood totally the message of Jesus Christ, which affirms the exact opposite. Jesus described God as a patient father, waiting at the gate to embrace a prodigal son who had deliberately done everything wrong. How can you ignore or misinterpret that story? Jesus told it. Your religion is joyful. Only Satan can turn it into a wet blanket. Listen to how Jesus ended the story with the delightful Father's words. My son was lost, now he's found. We must celebrate with a feast. So the party began and all were making merry. Those are the very words of Jesus Christ. You are the prodigal. That generous, loving Father is your God. What is not to understand? Which bring me to the second great affirmation of Jesus, God forgives. Be aware, Jesus grew up in the Jewish faith. He memorized the doctrine that there is no remission of sins without the shedding of blood. He watched as people sacrifice their most perfect animals as payment for sin, real or imagined. But then Jesus, with great courage, simply abolished that ancient practice. On several occasions, he said, your sins are forgiven. No quibbling, no bargaining, no sacrificing, no bloody animal. Almighty God forgives you. The concept seems too good to be true. Many miserable people do not believe it to this day. They do not want sins forgiven, especially the sins of other people. Good Jews responded to Jesus with hostility, shouting blasphemy. Eventually they killed him. But the comforting words of Jesus Christ remain as strong as ever. Every Sunday, many churches hear and repeat verbatim those four wonderful words, your sins are forgiven. How can that powerful assurance be a burden. And the third great affirmation of Jesus is life after death. In words even a child can understand, Jesus said, I am going to prepare a place for you so that where I am, you may be as well. To the man hanging on the cross beside him, both of them dying, Jesus and that man, Jesus said, this very day, you will be with me in paradise. Some people ridicule such belief as nothing more than wishful thinking. And I say to them, I have spent many years studying the advice of Jesus. My conclusion, what he taught has proven to be as sound, as stable, as rock, full of common sense and practical wisdom. When Jesus tells me specifically that I can count on life everlasting, I depend on that promise more than the notions of any other person on earth, no matter how, how wise they have claimed to be. Now, Jesus lived in a day when religion was a burden, an endless mass of restrictions and duties to be obeyed, and thou shalt not. He revised that dreary doctrine. He said, I came. Here's why I came. I came so that you may have life, and have it abundantly. I came not to lay a burden upon you, but to help you carry your load. Come to me, you who are weary and overburdened, and I will give you rest. I'm not making this up. I'm quoting the exact words of Jesus Christ. With Jeremiah, 
I say to you, speak no more ever of the burden of the Lord. According to Jesus, it is not a burden. Your religion is more like a party with your loving Father providing the very best of everything. Come on in. Cheer up. Join with the other children of God. And let us all make merry. Amen.